Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Trey, and I am a grateful recovering alcoholic. And I use he, him pronouns and hello, San Francisco. Hello, world. Uh, This is just, this is the most ultimate honor. And I just, I cannot thank all of you enough. Just everyone that Scott just thanked. I just, there's been so much work, so many emails, just so many conversations going back and forth to have gotten me to be able to speak to you in this moment. And I'm just, I'm so grateful. I, I can't put into words how meaningful this past weekend has been. I mean, it is just, I've been looking forward to this for, for so many years. I've been wanting to go to living sober for so many years. My sobriety date is March 21st, 2014. And it's been a bucket list item for me to be able to, to make it. And I haven't ever been able to yet until this year. And what a deal, what a deal that we have this gift and this everything. And I just, I'm in awe I'm so in awe. I didn't realize how much I needed this weekend. So thank you from the bottom of my heart. I don't want this moment to end. (laughs) They said I have 30 minutes, but I'm planning on like speaking for probably about six or seven hours. So just get comfortable. Okay. (laughs) Cause I just don't want this day to end. Uh, But I am just, I'm so grateful. So uh, basically what it was like is I was born a once upon a time on January 7th, 1981. And at that time I was born in a suburb outside of Chicago. I was actually born in the city. And I, uh, at that time was born a little girl. And uh, my, the, par- the name my parents gave me at that time was Ashley. And so I was born into the world, a little girl and growing up, as Ashley. uh, I love that name. I I mean, I love being Ashley. I was a very happy and carefree child. And the the truth is, I'll just give you a little background about (laughs) just that, just one little qualification on how how I'm sitting here today is the society didn't ever honestly ever see me as an Ashley. I did. I saw myself. I saw myself as Ashley, but it was just like the energy I was putting out to the world. They just didn't see it. It didn't quite match who I was. So as a child growing up, I was an athlete and I love sports, sports for my life. And people didn't call me Ashley. They called me Crashly because I was so aggressive. And then when I got a little bit older, I started chain smoking cigarettes. And so I'm the oldest, my little brother, stopped calling me Ashley and he uh, instantly started calling me Ash Trey. And then that quickly got shortened just to Trey. And now here we are, you know, and now I'm Trey basically. So for me, you know, this is how, just how, who, how I am, who I am sitting here today is Trey is it started out as Ashley and, and now it's Trey. And, and I like to tell people that I, I have navigated the entire LGBTQ spectrum wasted. (laughs) I would not recommend that. I wouldn't recommend that to anybody. It's such a beautiful process. And I was under the influence. And so for me, you know, doing that, the one of the last decisions I ever made was uh, actually my my name's Trey and it's short for Ash Trey. And that's embarrassing. It's definitely, it's embarrassing, but it is what it is. And, and now I, I can make decisions uh, sober and sane. And so, you know, basically though, as a child growing up, sports were my life and my absolute life. Soccer was the, my primary sport. And I played year round. My seasons would overlap with each other. I played soccer on different, multiple different teams before, before school, after school weekends. So did my brother. It was our whole lives. And I destroyed my body. I, I mean, from head to toe, I was destroying my body. I didn't know how to stop. I didn't know how to not play uh, just alcoholically from the get-go. I was just so aggressive and I loved it. I loved it. When off the field, I was really, uh, I didn't have that aggression off the field, but as soon as I got on the field, it was just, boom, it would come out. And so by 16, I'd had already had about a couple knee surgeries and I just, my whole, I was constantly in casts or braces. I spent a summer in a wheelchair. I mean, I was hurting myself. And by 16, I had a traumatic brain injury 
from a soccer game. And that was it. I, I really, I don't even go into detail anymore because it was so traumatic. I've noticed when I'm sharing about it, it's almost secondary trauma sharing it with others, but I severely injured my head in the soccer game. And that was it. That was May 22nd, 1997. I hadn't even started drinking yet. And it was a near death experience, hardcore, very hardcore. And my whole life changed. My whole identity changed as a 16 year old at that point. Uh, I could never play soccer again. My whole, it was like, what do I do now? Who am I? What do I do now? If I don't play soccer, who am I? It was the first time I really had to ask myself that question. And I was in extreme pain. And it's take, it took probably about, it's still, I'm still recovering, but it took about probably 19 full years for my brain to fully, fully heal. And I still take medicine to this day to prevent migraines. Uh, I, I had seizures at the time of the accident. I don't have to take medication for that anymore. Um, my lungs fully collapsed in that incident. And of course, then that, after that was when I became a chain smoker. So the fact that I even was able to start drinking was uh, a miracle because, <laughs> I mean, the fact that I even was alive. So school had always come natural for me. And after that, I really had to figure out how, to, how was I going to succeed in school because learning became difficult. Uh, anything I would study the night before, I would go in for a test the next day, and it was as if I had never even seen the material before. And that stayed, that has stayed with me. My short term memory was really affected. Of course, doing drugs hasn't helped either, <laughs> but really the brain injury was, it was hardcore. So uh, I had to learn how to walk again and talk again and just relearn everything almost as if I was a little child re doing flashcards, as if you would give a little, a little child flashcards. I was having to relearn everything. And it wasn't easy, but I persisted and I was able to go back to school. We didn't think I'd be able to go back. My, my sophomore year was done. I didn't finish sophomore year in school uh, the last few weeks. But junior year, I went back. I graduated. And at that time in high school, I'd been class president. I was homecoming queen. <laughs> uh, you know, I was doing everything I could to live the, the little, be a girl and all that. And, uh, but it just didn't really ever align with me. And then I went to a big 10 university and that's when my drinking just took off, took off. And I thought I was drinking just like my friends, but I wasn't, I wasn't at all. And I uh, was, all, it was always more extreme from the get-go and I joined a sorority and that's awkward being a man in a sorority. <laughs> I didn't know it at the time, but I, I always thought I'm a little different than these girls. I'm, I'm just, I'm different. I can't put my finger on it, but I, something's off. That can be the title of my book. Something's off. <laughs> I didn't know I was an alcoholic. I had no idea about, you know, I was just starting to figure out the sexuality and it was tough. I joke about it now, but it was tough. I was living with 120 gorgeous, awesome women. And I realized I was attracted to women. It was so difficult. It was difficult. You know, I, w I mean, it was not easy. And I basically just had this feeling, I got to get out of here. I got to get out of here. If I get to a different country, if I get to a different state, something's got to be different. <laughs> you know, I, so I just kept changing my identity and, you know, I don't know, you know, this deal. So I would go to the other side of the world. I felt much more comfortable in cultures where people didn't speak English. You know, I thought people would understand me. I'd be going out at night with, you know, on, on dates and with people that I became fluent when I was drinking uh, in other languages, you know, and the next morning I would be I would be so close to solving, you know, world peace or world hunger with this person. They didn't speak English. I didn't speak Thai, but we were so close to solving all the world's problems. And the next morning it was just like, I don't even know how to say hi in Thai. You don't even know how to say Thai in English, but I would be like, finally, you know, a woman that understands me, you know, and it was just, it was nuts. So, you know, that was my, you know, I just kept doing the geographics and I, and I finally started coming out. And, and the, the coming out process wasn't easy for me. And I can say now it's just this weekend. It's just been, it's such a gift to be a part of this population. But for me, it was the early two thousands. And I just didn't think that the world I lived in and the, the little bubble of my life would be accepting. And they are now, they're absolutely a hundred percent accepting. It's taking time though. It's taking time, uh, but they are, and I'm so grateful. So I entered the the LGBTQ scene in Chicago for my whole twenties, uh, all around alcohol. 
shockingly, <laughs> all around alcohol. It was, I wasn't really ever part of the scene. You know, I, I honestly didn't quite feel like I fit in. Even there, I didn't feel like I quite fit in. And uh, it wasn't until my late 20s I started, you know, really questioning my gender as well. And uh, by then, I was attempting to teach. I have a bachelor's degree in teaching at barely, barely, but I, I got it. And uh, by my late 20s, I was teaching. And, you know, I, I've been hospitalized a couple of times. I say 2003, that was for just pure insanity. By 2010, it was for severe depression. And that was when doctors were really telling me I had a problem with alcoholism. I thought my problem was Chicago winters. Truthfully, I didn't think my problem was alcohol. I just thought it was the weather. Uh, so I moved to Hawaii. Uh, I thought I needed year-round sun. I thought I needed to change my career and transition. And I did those things. And it significantly helped. But what I really needed was to get sober. And so it wasn't until 2014. I was alone. I mean, the, the, honestly, the only person that would drink with me towards the end of my drinking was my dog. Honestly, the only person that would drink with me was my dog. And I say that because my dog was my best friend. He was my best man. He was, he was the only person. I mean, my dog's a person, right? I love the, I, I love the texts that are like, uh, you know, I, I just the only person I wish I could text is my dog. <laughs> you know, like my boy, my boy, Jack. I mean, I love that dog. He just, he didn't have, he was, he didn't ask questions. You know, he didn't ask about pronouns or why I was cutting my hair or why I was doing all these different things. You know, he was, it was just unconditional love. He was just, he was the best and 12 and a half years. He just passed last year. I didn't think I'd ever be able to stay sober without Jack, but I, I have been, and I just, I can't not share and not, not mention my best man, you know? So, but it was, it, it was just Jack and I, and I was in a relationship, but uh, you know, it just wasn't going, that wasn't going well either. <laughs> Obviously, <laughs> as I'm hitting bottom with alcoholism, my relationship wasn't going well. I could only maintain relationships with animals. <laughs> still, no, honestly, still. No, I'm just kidding. But uh, basically, by 2014, I uh, hit bottom. I lost my career. I had, I had gone back to school and I, every I've gotten, you know, my high school degree, my college degree, and, and a master's degree in social work with honors. And I'm so grateful for that. Considering my head injury, I didn't think I'd be able to learn. So, so studying, it really is such an honor when I, you know, continue in school. Um, but it didn't matter. I lost another career in a really serious, significant way by 2014. It scared me. I was re I got really scared and I graduated in 2013 in May and within less than a year, I had lost another career. And so in 2010, I had first been introduced to AA when I was hospitalized for depression. And I didn't hear a single thing. Uh, I just, I didn't hear anything. I'd go into the meetings and I just, it was, it wasn't as if I was against it. I just, nothing was, I wasn't hearing anything if that makes sense. I just didn't hear anything. By 2014, I had no options left. I had to listen. And I really came in, I really came in with a, 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 the slightest open mind of saying, you know what, if, if they're going to talk about a higher power in God for one hour a day, fine. Fine. If I go to a meeting for an hour a day and people are talking about God for an hour a day, seriously, it's fine. I can handle that. I can, I'm, I'm beat down. <laughs> I've been beat down for as long as I can remember. I've been beat down. <laughs> so really, and now to be able to say AA has given me a relationship with a higher power that I can't explain it, but I just feel a presence greater than myself all the time with whatever name, whatever pronoun, whatever. It's just, it's there. And I am just in awe at the gifts that AA keeps giving me. I mean, what has this weekend even been? It's insane how great it's been. I just, I feel like, what am I going to do in a couple hours? If not every 15 minutes, my mind isn't being blown. And I, I love drinking and I love doing drugs. I love chain smoking. I loved it all. I love eating a gallon of ice cream. I mean, I just, 
who has a bowl of ice cream <laughs> when you could have an entire gallon? I'm sorry. I'm confused. <laughs> Mom, how can you only have a bowl? Like my mom's not an alcoholic. My brother's not an alcoholic. I have the greatest mom in the world. She mailed me this shirt this past week. She told me she got it at a sidewalk sale for next to nothing. She was just so excited. And I'm just, I have the greatest mom in the world. My brother is a rock. I am so fortunate for my family. My dad is the greatest man in the world. And I tell you that because I've worked 12 steps with Alcoholics Anonymous. And he has been drinking since the day I was born. And even now, uh, when we FaceTime, he's drinking. And he, he, he just loves alcohol. And so do I. And because of AA, I've been able to forgive my dad and, and more so forgive myself. And I've been in therapy since I was 19. And I'm 39, so 20 years. I've gone to therapy so long, I became a therapist. <laughs> I, I joke and say, you would go to therapy so long, eventually they just give you the credentials. It's just like, you get it. You just get it. So I've been in therapy so long that I am so grateful to now be a social worker and can help. Uh, these are my specialties, gender, sexuality, and addictions. Who knew I specialized in myself? And I didn't even attempt to do it. Uh, isn't that unreal? I'm so, so grateful. Uh, but my dad, I had been in therapy for 14 years when I got sober. And thank you to all the therapists that listened to me talk about my dad. And they've gotten me to such a great place with my dad. But I can truthfully, honestly tell you, it wasn't until I worked the steps that it was just boom to another level of forgiveness. And I could not believe that my sponsor, who's the greatest man in the world, for the first time told me that I needed to look at my part in my relationship with my dad. I'm sorry, there is no my part in this. It's just, it's everyone knows it's all him. Everyone knows. It's not me. I was just a child. I was only 18 years old. What could I have done wrong? You know, besides quite a few things, you know, so that was it. I mean, it was just, it was such a shift in my thinking because everyone sees my dad as this villain and he's made a lot of mistakes and he's taught me so much about so many great things in life. He's taught so many, so many incredible things. There's so much about who I am today that I'm forever grateful for my dad. He's taught me how to just, I'm very, very, very trusting. Uh, I, I'm, very, I love and I crave diversity because of my dad. Uh, he's taught me how to really time a joke. <laughs> he he's, he's, loves comedians, so he would let me stay up late and watch comedians. And he's very misunderstood. And I, I feel sometimes like I'm misunderstood, but I'm so grateful because this group really understands me. Uh, but he's just, he's a, he's a great man. He's done the best he could. And I have so much compassion for him today. And it's thanks to AA. And I just, it's just, I have to just say the amends that I made to my dad. Cause he just is like, he's just this like 76 year old man. He's like, ah, you know, dad, wah, nah, nah. you know, you know, it's just like, it doesn't matter. Uh, he doesn't need amends, you know, but he doesn't quite get that I've grown up because he left. My parents got, had a real, really tough divorce when I was 18. And he left and he, and it's his, it was his one geographic and he moved to Seattle and he's been there ever since. Uh, and I'm going to just say this, I haven't ever said this before, but if anyone's in Seattle, he's actually a professional hypnotist and he somehow is specialized in this population. I mean, he, if anyone's ever quit smoking in the Seattle area, there's a good chance my dad's hypnotized you. And my dad one time goes to me, I don't care if they're straight or gay. My only job is to hypnotize them. And I'm like, oh my God, how is this my dad a hypnotist? This is seriously insane. How did he become a hypnotist? I have no idea, but it's just so great because I wouldn't have known that my dad hypnotized like our, like the LGBTQ population. He's like, well, I hypnotized one that, you know, identified as homosexual. And then he sent his friends and I was just like, how did this happen? You know, but it's so great. It's like these, these conversations that I can have with my dad today. I'm just like picturing my dad hypnotizing and, and they stop smoking. It's so great. So I just, I love my dad, but basically uh, the, he still thinks I'm a child. You know, he still thinks I'm a little, a little girl <laughs> you, to some degree, you know, he, he loves me as a man, but you know, he just, he missed so many years. 
he missed so much that when when I you know I now go uh, to see him and he still you know says to me things like hey you want to go to the zoo and I'm like not really but sure I mean we can go to the zoo it's been a while and that's where I did my amends to my dad was at the Seattle Zoo and it's awkward being two grown men at the zoo with no children. You know, it's like you need a child to be at the zoo. So that's where I did my amends to my dad was at the Seattle Zoo. And then after he's like, yeah, it's water under the bridge, you know. And then after he'll, he would, you know, say, you know, like, all right, now let's go get you an ice cream cone. <laughs> you know, like I'm a five-year-old. But I'm just, I'm forever grateful to have given, been given the gift of forgiveness for my dad. Can't put it into words how grateful I am. And, you know, since getting sober, I've been able, after my dog Jack died last year, the first thing I did, and I'm talking first thing I did was go to a meeting. I went to Connie Ali'i. I got to give a shout out. You know, what I used to would have said was, if you ever can make it to Hawaii, come to Connie Ali'i. But now if it's Monday night and you're a real night owl, it's at 745 Hawaii time. Click that link. It's an LGBTQ meeting and I'm forever grateful. I'm a morning person. You know, I, I go to meetings at 6.30 a.m., but it's my one night meeting because it's that important to me to just connect with this community. And it was a Monday that my dog passed. And that night I was in that meeting and just said, you know, my best friend died today and they were there for me. And then, you know, I thought I'm going to do something fun. I'm going to do something for myself to just plan something to, to, to just, just to celebrate Jack's life and world pride was coming up. It was last year. And I thought I'm going to go and I'm going to watch world pride and just go for a week and be in New York city. That city to me is the definition of a city that's alive. It's New York city. And I just so much love for New York city right now and all, all of our worlds, all of our world. And I went, but the coolest thing was, is I went back into Connie Ali'i a couple of weeks later and I go, hey, everybody, guess what? I just booked a trip. I'm going to go to New York City and go to World Pride. And someone in the meeting goes, hey, you know what? There's a really incredible conference that's going on. It's a men's conference. And I'm actually speaking. And it was just this moment of, wait, people in this meeting are going to be in New York at the same time I'm going to be in New York. It was just this moment of, like, I'm not no longer alone because I've been doing things for myself for so long, I've been so fortunate and I've traveled the world by myself for so long. And I'm very comfortable on my own. I live in Hawaii by myself. My family's not here. But it was just this moment of, wait, you're going to be in New York also? And there's an AA conference? What? I, it just was unreal. And and this man said, a great friend of mine said, you know what, the, the conference is sold out. And it was just this moment of, all right, I am going to scalp tickets and I am going to be at this conference. And then this realization of, since when have I wanted to scalp tickets for AA? <laughs> you know, it's just like, how did this happen? How did I get like FOMO for AA? You know, I, I, it, I was five years sober at the time and, you know, I came in kicking and screaming. I did not, this was not something that they, someone said, yes, five years later, Trey, you're going to be wanting to scalp tickets for this. I'd be like, you're insane. Thanks. Uh, no, but I did. And I, and it was the first time I ran name dropped. I was like, hello, aloha. My name's Trey and a great friend from one of my favorite meetings is speaking and I'm coming from Hawaii. And I said everything I possibly could to be like, I need to be at this conference. And it was incredible. The, you know, the GSM uh, conference they, for the, for, for men in, in recovery and gay and sober, queer and sober, whatever you want to call it. And it was just, one of the most incredible conferences just like this. I mean, just a weekend of recovery. And not only did I watch World Pride, I got to walk in it. And my, my mind was blown. I mean, just because it was a lot of layers I've had to peel back over these years for myself. When I first, looking back, how many years ago to, you know, I really think alcoholism is a disease of denial. And since I Day one, when I first started drinking, my friends would tell me that I was, I, I drank differently. And I had a traumatic brain injury. My mind was already severely impaired. I had had six concussions before that. When I drank, my, it was like things were exploding. I mean, I was a blackout drinker from be, the beginning. So, but to really wrap my head around the fact that I was an alcoholic, I did not want to be like my dad. And people, since I was a 
very, very, very early on, people would tell me that I was like my dad. People wouldn't say that's my brother. People would tell me, I did not want to be like him. That was someone I did not want to be like. So to be able to say that I am an alcoholic and I'm sober. And then the other layer of, I would look in the mirror and I would truly see this beautiful woman's body. But I would say, I just swear that that is just not accurate. I can't quite explain it, but I just don't think this is quite accurate. And so to be able to say like, yeah, I'm bi, gay, lesbian, queer, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I'm all of it. I'm all of it. And now I'm just a human being who, who loves everybody and single. <laughs> I like to put that in there. I'm just loving life and, and enjoying this phase of life to the best of my ability. But to walk in pride and to say, I cannot believe I'm not wasted at pride right now. How did I, how is this possible? How can I be sober, gay and sober and walking in this major contingent? And, you know, there's so many people on the side being like, mm, girl, I'll get there next year. <laughs> I'll see you next year, queen. <laughs> you know, and I was like, that was me. I mean, but to see, we were a huge double-decker bus with hundreds of people. Just, you know, that I felt so proud in that moment to be able to spread that aloha and that love and that energy of maybe even if just one person out of thousands could say they're gay and sober and having fun. Like maybe, who knows, maybe next year they will be with us. So that was just so mind blowing. So, such a profound moment in my sobriety and the drop the rock. We did a drop the rock right outside the Statue of Liberty. And I mean, just to to write one word and just be able to drop the rock and just let it go. And just really this year, I mean, 2020, I mean, this is living sober 2020. I mean, this is a phenomenal year. This is a historic moment. And this is an intense time. And there is significant amount of suffering in the world right now. There's no two ways around it. And I have so much love. And I have so much compassion for each and every one of you to have shared so much vulnerability and so much strength. And I just feel like I've been elevated to the fourth dimension and beyond this weekend to be able to just carry this message forward. And wow, I mean, people have been asking me, in the last couple months, like what am I doing and how how have I been able to stay strong? And my answer is Alcoholics Anonymous. And I'm not just saying that because I'm speaking in a meeting with Alcoholics Anonymous right now. I'm speaking that because it's the truth. I've been able to stay strong because these meetings have shifted and gone on the Zoom. And my last in-person meeting was on March 21st of 2020. That was my sobriety date. It was my very last meeting. It was the day that I turned six and I go, things are about to shift. But my attitude is, is it's not the strongest who will survive. It's those who can most adapt to change. And we're doing that. And I cannot thank you enough for simply shifting so fast and to to have gotten this conference online. And I've been debating recently about doing a professional conference online in September And I've been going back and forth. Do I want to do this? Do I not? It looks really intense. Do I have the stamina for this? But I'm going to sign up later today. I'm going to do it because why not? If I can do this for AI, I can do this professionally to to grow in my own career. And I I am so grateful because Alcoholics Anonymous, it makes me look professional because so so many people I've been saying, oh, I have a conference this weekend or I I can't talk right now. I've got a meeting, (laughs) you know, and it's all for AA. It's all for AA. But, you know, it just it just makes you look up. It makes you look professional. Right. Uh, But but whatever's right. And And I have been able to go back to the countries, both countries that I lived, I was able to study abroad and teach abroad in in my disease, uh, in my college years and right after. And I've been able to go back to both of those countries. And it's as if I've experienced two totally different places in the world. I was able to go to, my height of my drinking was not probably around my, my college years really, but around 21, I was able to go back to a conference, an AA conference in Australia. And it blew my mind. They were, they were offering me a cup of tea 
And I was like, since when do Australians drink tea? I thought you were all blackout drinkers. <laughs> I, I had no clue. I've been, you know, arrogantly saying since 2002, when I first went to Australia, that the entire country of Australia are blackout drinkers because that's what I believe. I'm talking, I love these Aussies. I love what's happening down under. They are good people, but I had no idea that anyone was sober because I wasn't. And I went back and I go, I just, I, I was like, well, obviously you're putting drugs in your tea. There's no way you're just drinking tea, but I couldn't believe it. It was unreal. And what a great experience that was. And then I was able to go back to Northern Thailand where I taught English and I've stayed in contact with my friends that uh, are in the same school in which I taught over these years. And I genuinely believed I was going to blow their minds because when I was first there, of course, I was female and going back being male, I thought I'm going to blow their minds. You know, I've always loved a little bit of the shock factor. And when I went back, they weren't phased. I mean, they just weren't even phased. They just did their little bow and that was it. And the day went on. And then when we went out for dinner that night and they found out that I wasn't drinking, they all started screaming that it was a miracle. It's a miracle. It's a miracle. And I just, I go, it's a, I couldn't believe like my, my transition to male didn't, they didn't bat an eye, but they found out that I wasn't smoking and they screamed, it's a miracle. And, and they started saying to me, they're going, you're crazy lady. You're a crazy lady. They kept calling me a crazy lady. And I, I was just, I, I just, you know, you just have to laugh. I just laugh at myself. I don't take things too seriously these days. And, you know, it is what it is. People, people know, you know, you all know me, 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 me here now, but people that know you in the past, it's like, we know you, right? So I just have to say, I've been, I, I did lose my career in 2014, but I've been able to get it back entirely. Uh, I've been able to work as a substance abuse counselor and help alcoholics. And I've been able to work with uh, the LGBTQ population. And since March of this past year, go into private practice and I'm now running my own business. It's not at all what I thought. I spent an entire year looking for an office and I found it. And on March 3rd, I was my very first day in the office. And two weeks later, that was it. <laughs> and this is my office now. I hope you like it. It's my bedroom and it's my office and it's everything. <laughs> and I see everyone online and it's, a, it's God is a sense of humor, right? And another bold move I made, but you know, I just have to say, I'm forever grateful. The fact that I can help and be in service for my occupation. It's, I love it. I love working for myself and Every single day, I'm forever, forever grateful to be able to carry this message and be in service and to say, whatever life transition people are possibly going through, if it is anything LGBTQ related or help someone get sober just a little bit sooner or not have to navigate the whole spectrum or whatever it is, I'm just so fortunate to be able to be sober, to be sober today and Truthfully, the last thing I'll share that's been really a fascinating experience is, you know, I thought I was so spiritual. I got to a point where I was so spiritual that March 1st, I actually moved into a meditation center. I thought, I'm just going to be a little extreme. Let's just do step 11 to the max. And moving into communal living in March of 2020 was also a bold move. <laughs> what was I thinking? Uh, seriously. What was I thinking? You want to you wanna really test your sobriety, move into communal living, March of 2020. So here's where I am right now. I wish you could have seen me right before this. You have no idea how loud meditation centers can be. I have been running around all morning being like, I need you all to just not gong the gongs for 30 minutes. I need you to all just meditate more silently while I speak. It's so funny, you know. This is really tested me to my limits. It's principles over personalities. I will be honest, it sometimes can get so quiet though that my vibrator is rocks this entire house. <laughs> you have no idea. That's I go, okay, what am I supposed to do here? I thought moving into a meditation center, I would just no longer look at what you look what we look at it on the I thought just I'm like, I'm no longer gonna look at dick pics. I'm in a meditation center, but I'm still human. 
I couldn't believe that after the first night, I wasn't going to be enlightened. I woke up the next morning with anxiety. I go, it's just a building with four walls. You know, I can't believe I'm not enlightened yet, but I've been here since March. I still have issues. It fascinates me. You know, I actually realize I have more issues than ever before. So living in a meditation center has been an incredible experience. I can't even tell you. My entire life is beyond my wildest dreams. Every single day I get up, I make my bed, I get on my knees, I pray to a higher power, conscious contact, higher than myself. I go to one meeting a day. I talk to my family every day. I talk to my sponsor. I get in service, best of my abilities. If I can share with you one more, one more incredible service opportunity I've been a part of for the last six years is taking meetings to the outer islands of Hawaii. If, ever, if anyone's ever interested in that, we have two really remote meet. Um, Hawaiian islands called Molokai and Lanai. They're very remote and it's been incredible going to those islands and helping get the fellowship going on those islands. And that's been my favorite, favorite uh, service opportunities. And we, we camp out for the weekends, the, the four major islands of Maui, Kauai, Oahu, and the big island. We all gather together to bring them fellowship, to keep them going because they have like next to no meetings on those outer islands. So being in service, having a home group, doing the steps, doing the traditions, doing the principles, just being sober, being able to just live authentically in the present moment. I wear a watch, it just says now, it doesn't tell the time. I do the best I can just to be be in the now. And really, I'm so grateful. Thank you for getting me through the last six years. And especially this year, this year is one that Unless I get stage four Alzheimer's, I'm not going to forget. And you are all such beautiful souls. You've touched my heart and my soul this weekend. So really, really from the bottom of my heart, mahalo keakua. Thank you, God, for asking me to share. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.